Hey buddy Crow back again with another Evercade video. This time we're going to be looking at Jalico Collection 1. This is a collection of 10 games that were published by Jalico. Some of them were even developed by Jalico. Uh, there is a uh, kind of a diversity of games in here. We do have a sports game. We have uh, what I consider a hidden gem. You'll have to see what that is. A couple of well-known NES classics are also in here or uh, maybe classic is not the word. Uh, so at least one of them is a classic. The other one is uh, kind of infamous, I think. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to go over uh, these games. I'm going to talk about each one for about a minute or so. And I'm going to uh, rank each one on a scale from one to five, as I always do. And as a reminder, a five is a game I consider to be great, really high up there. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Very few things I would change about the game. A4 is what I consider to be a good game. It's a game that I still had fun with, but I, I think further tweaks would be uh, needed to make that even a, a even better game. A3 is what I consider to be an okay game. It's a game I'm kind of like in the middle of. I neither liked it nor disliked it. Just right down the middle. Uh, and then I, 2 is what I would consider to be a poor game. A game I didn't really like. And, but I would consider maybe going back to it just to try it again, or maybe I could see some merit in, you know, maybe going for a high score or something. And A1 is what I consider just to be a flat out bad game, a game so bad that I wouldn't want to ever play it again. And, it, you know, to be honest, it's very rare that I would rank a game bad. I've only done it a handful of times in the past. And um, as always, the, I'm ranking these as I feel how uh, they play on the Evercade itself, not on the original hardware. And again, this is all just my own personal opinion. So if you happen to really, really like a game and I don't, well, we're going with my score <laughs> instead. So, you know, without any more um, holding off, let's jump into our first game. The first game is Astyanix, otherwise known as the Lord of King in its Japanese release. And this is a side-scrolling hack-and-slash platforming game that was originally released in 1990 for the NES. You play as a Cyanex, a high school student, who is magically transported to the world of Lemnia to rescue a princess from the evil Blackthorn. Guided by the fairy cutie, you navigate each stage until you defeat Blackthorn to rescue the princess. The game plays like your typical hack-and-slasher with a few twists. The first that if you repeatedly swing your weapon, it will lose power. After every swing, you can wait for your weapon's strength to charge back up so it can inflict its maximum damage, and some power-ups can be collected to increase the weapon's maximum damage output. Also you've got some magic that can be used including fireballs, lightning, and the ability to freeze enemies in place for a limited amount of time. These abilities will drain your magic meter fairly quickly, so you must make the best use of it. I happen to like this game quite a bit. The music is great, and the characters are nice and big for an NES game. There are a couple downsides though. The hit detection sometimes can seem to be a bit off, and sometimes there could be quite a bit of slowdown, but other than that, the game was pretty fun to play through, especially with the Evercade save state ability. I'll give this game a 4 simply because of the hit detection. If that was less of an issue, I could have easily bumped this game up a rating. Game 2 is Bases Loaded, originally released for the NES in 1988 and in Japan a year earlier under the title Moraru Pro Yaku, which I probably mispronounced. At first glance, this is your standard baseball game on the NES, and there's not really too much that makes this stand out among the sea of baseball games that were on the NES. The pitching and batting is done from a behind the pitcher view, and the fielding is your standard zoomed in overview of the field that follows the ball. Pitching and batting are pretty intuitive, although it can be pretty tough to gauge the balls and strikes based on the catcher's mitt because it doesn't exactly follow the extremes the ball does. There were times where the catcher clearly looked like he didn't catch the pitch, but it doesn't appear as though wild pitches can happen in this game, so it looks very odd at times. It also doesn't seem as though the batter can be hit by the pitch either, as the ball will seem to go right through them. Fielding can be a chore at times since there's no indication of the character you're controlling, so sometimes you'll miss the ball just because you think you're controlling another character. Not only that, but the fielding winds up being really dull since you can't jump or dive for the ball, although the fielders will automatically dive if they feel like it. Base running is a total mess though. It's not intuitive at all. 
I figured out how to advance bases, but not how to send runners back. And that makes it very frustrating since runners will always fully run to the next base automatically during a pop fly. And since I couldn't figure out how to send them back, everyone winds up being out. And it's not like I didn't try to figure out how to send them back. I looked up both the Evercade manual and the original NES game manual, and it just doesn't tell you how to do it. I'm calling this game poor and giving it a two based on the bland gameplay, frustrating fielding and base running, and the lack of features. Not only that, but there are three other bases loaded games on the NES, and this is the one they put into collection? Personally, I grew up with Bases Loaded 2, and though I haven't played it in a long time, I remember it being much better than this. The third game on the cart is Brawl Brothers, originally released on the Super Nintendo in 1993. The game was originally released as Rushing Beat Ran, Fukusai Toshi a year earlier in Japan, and is actually the second game in the Rushing Beat series. There are a ton of beat-em-ups on the Super Nintendo, and so we've got to ask ourselves, what sets this one apart from the rest? Well, we've got a roster of five selectable characters, though for some reason you'll select two at the start, and you'll only be able to select between those two characters in between continues, until you advance to the next stage, and then another character will join you, and so forth. The characters themselves all play differently, and they have their standard punch, jump, running attacks, and special attacks, although I'm not quite fond of the special attack move draining your health, because by making the game that way, it makes me never want to use the special attack, no matter how cool it may be. There's also a dedicated button for throwing items, which is nice, and a taunt button, which serves no purpose at all. All in all, the fighting is kind of fun, and I like how the enemies can hurt each other on accident when they attack. What's interesting is that in the options menu, there's an option to turn on anger mode. And what this does is if your character takes several hits, they start to flash and they become invincible and it also makes them stronger for a limited amount of time. I think this is a pretty cool feature, but why isn't it on by default? Also, why is there a sewer maze in the first level of the game? Why would you want to frustrate players right from the beginning? But there's actually something quite interesting in this game. If you do a certain code on the Jalico boot up screen, you can actually play the Japanese version of the game, which is a bit more fun, a little different, and a bit easier. For example, there's no maze in the sewer in level 1. The only downside is I don't know how stable the game is since it's soft locked on me in stage 2. And if you want to know what that code is, well, you could just look it up on your own. It's very easy to find. All in all, I kind of had fun with this game. I very nearly gave it a 4, but I've got to bump it down to a 3 and say it's just okay. I mean, there are plenty of beat em ups out there, and this one is just frustrating enough to make me want to play something else instead. Game 4 is City Connection, which was originally an arcade game released in 1985. However, this is the Famicom slash NES port, which was released in Japan the same year, but not in the US until 1988. The goal of the game is to simply drive over every piece of road. However, other vehicles on the road prove as obstacles. By collecting and firing oil cans will cause them to spin out and also allow you to knock them off the screen. A non-moving cat will occasionally appear and must be avoided since the oil cans have no effect on it. Also, if you take too long on a level, spikes will start to appear, making things more difficult as well. Red balloons will also appear, which can give you a point bonus or even warp you to another level if collected. Now, City Connection is a game I want to like, but every time I play it, a lot of little annoyances occur to hinder my enjoyment. The road itself scrolls in a jittery motion, not like everything else in the game, and it just doesn't look right. The car is constantly moving, and every time you turn around, you have to wait a bit for your car to pop a wheelie to indicate that you can jump again. And this action seems to take longer on the NES than it does in the original arcade version. And then there's the randomly appearing cat, and that is the biggest nuisance in the game, because he appears out of nowhere, sometimes you don't see him until it's too late, or sometimes he can even box you into a certain section, making it difficult to escape. This game could have been done much better on the NES, but I'm not going to say it's a bad or poor game, nor will I say that I particularly like it. I'm going to give this one a 3 and say it's just okay. 
The fifth game is Earth Defense Force, a shoot 'em up for the Super Nintendo, which was released in the US in 1992 and slightly earlier in Japan under the name Super EDF Earth Defense Force. The story is your pretty standard shoot 'em up cliche of the Earth being under attack from an alien threat, and your ship is the only one that can engage the enemy and defend the Earth. The real question here is that this is a Super NES shoot 'em up that nobody really seems to talk about these days. What's the reason for that? Well, Earth Defense Force does do things a bit differently from your typical shoot 'em up from the day. You have the ability to choose from three different ship speeds on the fly, and there are no power-ups to collect in the game. Rather, every time you start a level, you're given an option of selecting one of eight different weapon types, and the weapon automatically upgrades based on how many enemy craft you destroy, up to a maximum of level five. You are also given a shield, which can take up to three hits, but there is no stock of ships in reserves, so when your ship goes down, you have to continue from the start of the beginning of the level that you were on, and that's if you have continue credits. Finally, you're given a couple of satellite orbs, which can also fire, and can be set up into different configurations depending on the weapon level. The music in the game isn't bad, but it's not memorable either. The graphics are good with some pretty impressive background effects at times, and there's nothing really bad about the controls either. When I started playing the game, it felt like it might have been a little bit too difficult, but I found that by selecting the homing attack made the game pretty playable. So for every level, I chose the homing attack, until I realized near the end of the game that it may not have been such a great idea for the last level. One of the last bosses in the game has an orb that flies around the screen that cannot be destroyed, but most of my shots would home in on it anyway. So defeating that boss took me a really long time. And the final boss? Well, I couldn't do it. I had to give up as I wasn't skilled enough to dodge all the green slime being thrown at me. So ultimately, I'm going to give this a 3 and say it's just okay. Aside from some neat Mode 7 effects, the game winds up being pretty bland, and it's also just a little too difficult for my taste. It's not great, it's not bad, it's kind of mediocre, which is why probably nobody talks about this title these days. And we're halfway through talking about these games. So I want to use this opportunity to ask that if you are liking this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Thanks. Game six is Operation Logic Bomb, the ultimate search and destroy. Though I think the subtitle is optional since it doesn't even appear at the title screen. The game was originally released in 1993 for the Super Nintendo and was also known as Akira no Yosai in Japan. In this game, you control Agent Logan, a human with bioelectrical implants, as he infiltrates the facility that's been taken over by an unknown faction. The game is heavy action with some light puzzle solving elements as you get a top down view while shooting all enemies in sight. You could fire in eight directions, but holding down the left shoulder button will lock your firing direction, allowing you to move in any direction while firing in the same direction. As you proceed throughout the facility, you'll have to figure out how to access new areas, whether it's destroying certain objects or enemies, or simply figuring out which teleporters to use. Accessing computer terminals and containers will sometimes yield health, items, or even new weapons. Not only that, but sometimes you'll see cutscenes to events that are currently happening, or have happened in the past. I really like this game. The controls are pretty solid and the action was pretty fun. I really like collecting the new weapons and figuring out the best situations to use each in, as getting new weapons does not render the old ones obsolete. Figuring out how to advance through the game requires a little thought, but isn't too difficult. I really like the cutscene shown throughout the game as it helps shows what has happened or what is happening and will often foreshadow what will happen in the game next. Pretty impressive considering there's absolutely no dialogue in these scenes. When I started playing, I was thinking that since this game really doesn't talk much about these days, I thought it might be rather mediocre. But that's not the case at all. This is a true hidden gem in the Super Nintendo library, and I couldn't give it anything less than a 5. The seventh game is Rival Turf, a side-scrolling beat-em-up for the Super Nintendo released in 1992. The Japanese version of this game goes under the name Rushing Beat, and yes, this is the prequel to the previously talked about game on this cartridge, Brawl Brothers. I don't really know much about the storyline here, but 
What does that matter? This is a simple beat em up where you continually walk to the right, beating up every goon you encounter until you beat the boss goon, and then advance to the next level. You are given a choice of two characters with simple controls, an attack button, a jump button, a run button, and a special attack button. Something that sets this game apart from other beat-em-ups is that a special attack can only be earned after five opponents are defeated. But that's about it. There's really nothing else that sets this game apart from the other beat-em-ups out there. Simple controls, stiff animations, forgettable music, and the special attacks you have to earn aren't really all that special. In fact, the only thing I'm really going to remember about this game is the fact that when your character runs out of energy, they will always get back up to only then immediately fall over and die. It happens every time and I always get a chuckle out of it. The sequel, Brawl Brothers, is a slightly better game, but for Rival Turf, I'm going to give it the same rating and say it's just okay. A funny thing I have to mention here, though, is that every time I've typed out Rival Turf in this script, I've accidentally written Rival Turd. This must be my subconscious telling me something. Game number 8 is Super Goal 2, which was originally released in the US in 1994 and in Japan a year prior under the title Takata Nobuhiro no Super Cup Saka. And if you can't tell already, this is a soccer game for the Super Nintendo, and as far as I can tell, it tries to go for realism as opposed to a more arcadey gameplay. And I'll be honest here, I really don't know much about soccer. I'm not a huge sports fan to begin with, but I am familiar with the rules and strategies for sports such as baseball, football, hockey, and to a lesser extent, basketball. But when it comes to soccer, all I really know is you don't use your hands and go. But I think I should be able to pick up and play a soccer game. I mean, it's somewhat like hockey, just without the ice, right? I mean, there's a ball and you should be able to pass and shoot it. If the other team is in control, you know, there's a button for steal. Well, Super Goal 2 does have those buttons, but in multiple varieties. There's a button for long passes, short passes, high kicks and shooting. And sometimes the buttons are combined and I thought it was all a bit confusing. I kind of tried to default to using the short pass button to pass, but that only passes to players with the word pass over their heads, and sometimes it changes right before I pass. Another trouble I had is selecting the player I wanted to control. The L and R buttons are assigned for that, but it would always take forever to cycle to the player I actually would want to control. And not only that, but when I would pass it to another player, the game would always switch me control of that player right before they got the ball, and so I'd immediately start running away from the ball, not realizing I was in control. You know, I'm probably playing this game all wrong, but I'm really not familiar with these types of quote-unquote realistic soccer games. The closest thing to soccer I've enjoyed recently is Rocket League. So if you're a soccer super fan out there and you're probably already mad at me for calling it soccer and not football, and you really enjoy these types of games, I'll just have to apologize to you later for giving this game a 2 and saying it's poor. It's not my thing and playing it only frustrates me. The ninth game is The Ignition Factor, originally released for the Super Nintendo in 1995 and a few months prior in Japan as simply firefighting. When I first saw this game, I was thinking that this was going to be an action heavy type of game where you must put out all the fires and rescue any people you encounter, but this game is actually not that. It turns out your main objective is saving the people trapped in the fire and really only putting out the fires that hinder your path. Not only that, but you are given the option to use more than just your fire hose, as you can carry a variety of different fire extinguishers for different types of fires, water bombs, explosives, an axe, or some rope. You can't carry too much though, since weighing yourself down can slow you down and prevent you from running and jumping. Luckily, there are other firefighters with you in each scenario, and finding them will let you switch items with what they have. Ultimately, this game really winds up being a puzzle game. Since you're on a time limit in each stage, you may have to play through each scenario multiple times before you figure out the best loadout to start with, the best pass to take, and how to handle certain situations. Such as one part where one of the individuals refuses to be rescued unless her friend is rescued first. Also, it would be in your best interest to rescue everybody as quick as possible since the fires get worse the more time that goes by. The game is interesting, but it does have a few downsides, and it starts with the control. 
It's not that the control is bad, but there's one thing that just doesn't make any sense. If your firefighter isn't carrying too many things, they can run. And you would think there would be a dedicated run button or possibly double tapping the D-pad will cause you to run. But the way it actually works here is that while you're walking and you quickly release and hit the D-pad again in the same direction, then the firefighter will run. If that isn't awkward enough, the firefighter will continue running even if you release the D-pad. You actually have to tap the D-pad again to stop running. It's so bizarre that I found myself running into fires off of ledges and even into molten iron, the later of which means instant death. The AI-controlled characters aren't too bright either as I've witnessed people in need of rescue or even other firefighters calmly walking right into a fire and getting burned. And it doesn't really seem to hurt them in the long run, they'll just get up and start walking again, and it's just odd. Lastly, the game does have several items you can use, but it doesn't tell you what some of them are. I only figured some of these items out through experimentation, and though I'm sure the original game manual will tell you what they are, the Evercade manual does not. In the end, I thought this was an enjoyable game, and I'll give it a 4. If your character controlled a bit better, and I accidentally didn't run to my death on occasion, and the computer AI was a bit better, I think I could have bumped the score up a notch. The last game on the cartridge is Totally Rad, originally released for the NES in 1991 and a year earlier in Japan as Magic John. The main difference between the two versions is that the US version has had most of the character graphics reworked to remove the anime aesthetics of the Japanese version and all of the dialogue has had 90 surfer lingo added to make the US version totally rad, dude. So, in Totally Rad, you are in control of Jake, an apprentice of the magical Zebediah, who is in the middle of his magical training when, out of nowhere, he is attacked, and the game starts. As you play throughout the game, the story has some twists and turns that I actually wasn't expecting, and I will not spoil them here. At first, the gameplay seems pretty straightforward, a standard side-scrolling platformer where you can shoot out magic to attack the monsters in your path, and if you hold down your attack button, you can charge up your magic for a more powerful shot, and if that was it, this would be kind of a bland game. But the game actually surprised me when I realized I had so much more magic at my disposal. By hitting the start button, you'll find you'll have a wide variety of magic to choose from, and while in the game, you can activate what you've selected by hitting up and the attack button. You can heal yourself, freeze the enemies, make yourself invincible, attack with four different elements, or even transform yourself into three other creatures with special abilities. A fish man, a bird man, or a lion man. You do have a limited magic meter, so you do have to be careful with how you use your magic, and if you transform into a creature, you cannot use any other magic unless you transform yourself back into human form. I thought this was a fantastic element to the game, and as the game progressed, it was obvious that there was some magic better suited to certain situations than others. I'm gonna give this game a 5 and say it's great. I didn't have any issues with the controls, and playing through the game was pretty fun, with some weird story twists and even weirder bosses. Some people might be annoyed by the 90s surfer lingo, but I think it's like, totally rad, dude. And there you go, that is all 10 games on this uh, Jellico Collection one. I uh, liked some of the games, and some of the games I didn't like, and I think the majority of them, four out of the 10 of them, I would put right in the middle, just okay, meaning that I could take them or leave them. Um, and that as a whole kind of, you know, makes this whole collection a little on the, uh, you know, the lower side if I were to rank all these collections. But, you know, some games like Operation Logic Bomb really took me by surprise. Uh, so did T Totally Rad. That was a game I hadn't really played before. Uh, Stein X, again, and I'll rate that, I didn't rate that the highest, but again, it was up there. I really did like that one. But again, a lot of these games, I <laughs> could leave them. Um, so, yeah. That is Jellico Collection 1. Uh, next up is going to be, oh, I had to think about it, Pico Collection 2. I think there's 13 games on that one, if I'm not mistaken. And if I am mistaken, I'm going to have to record this again. But that's what I'm going to start playing and looking into. And uh, that'll be the next Evercade video. So thanks for watching. See you all next time. Bye.